a headhunter called me and said, um, look, I've got this Australian opportunity. On face value, it doesn't look that exciting. It's MMDS, it's eight channels. And I said, well, why would I do that? I mean, I'm running a highly sophisticated platform. Japan is beckoning. The headhunter said, don't go to Japan because four out of five executives that I send to Japan end up divorced with Japanese girlfriends within two years. So thank goodness I made the right decision. It came with the right company. My first job at All Star was really as Chief Operating Officer, rolling out the various systems that we operated throughout regional Australia. We just did everything from the very beginning. It was just amazing. And I remember, you know, we had a whiteboard with John Porter figuring out a work order. It was just hilarious. We had a little sign on the door that said CETV. Our first month, we sent out the bills on QuickBooks. We hand stuffed the envelopes and mailed them. It was like, we're just going to get stuff done. And you know, that's what I like. You know, we were going to set the world on fire. <laughs> I don't think anyone coming in could have imagined the base at which we were starting. Goodbye to your last excuse. Here's the All-Star No Excuses installation offer. You know, when you're trying to launch a new product that nobody is familiar with, and you've got to make 2,000 sales a week to gain subscribers. They didn't get the service at all. They couldn't get their heads around, why in the world would I pay for television? So it was a huge education process. All-Star at that point was Definitely a startup business. It was very much about well, what's the price and what's the offer and how do we actually get people in. That's right. What really excited me in the first couple of years was the passion and excitement of the people who worked in the industry who was new, great opportunity for them. They were really turned on and very few things got in the way of their enthusiasm. I remember one time going to Jackman Road, which was our first office in the Gold Coast. And uh, I walked in there in, uh, in the summer and it was about 44 degrees uh, in this big metal box. But everybody was continuing on, sweat pouring off them. Foxtel ran an ad in the paper saying, you know, don't have unsightly antennas on your roofs, get cable, it's here now, do it today. And a lot of people called Foxtel to get service. But the only thing was is they only had built out about 150 homes. And uh, so they sought us out because we were running ads at the same time. And one morning I came to work at our warehouse on Jackman Ave, and there was a line of people around the front door of the warehouse that wanted to buy service. It was uh, manic, strap yourself in. We were ramping up to the point where we were doing about 100 installs a day. You know, we were buying rolls of cable and supplying connectors and, you know, microwave antennas and masting and everything we could think of was all in the shed being delivered by the droves. It was a real uh, entrepreneurial spirit in there that uh, I got a real kick out of. John was legendary in those days. He was out setting up all these sites. I'm sure there are many stories about John and the evening entertainment uh, at the bar, just really engaging everyone. And I think from that foundation, this spirit of Ostar really evolved. That period of sort of 97, 98, ending in you know, 99 was a very exciting period. We were adding, you know, 80,000 subscribers a year. It was uh, a crazy year, 1999. We literally floated the company at the absolute apex of the dot-com boom. Yeah, those first couple of years were fantastic. Share price was going like this. We were still launching new products, and pushing them out the door, and that's, you know, that's very exciting. We were a company that was not profitable, was spending probably 100 to $200 million a year in negative cash flow to roll its business out. So there's probably no other time in history we could have followed a company like that successfully. Back then, it was a, there wasn't really a process. It was, it really, it was, there really wasn't. But it's kind of more exciting when, it, when it's the cowboy approach. And it's, and it's just flat out and we'll get it done and it's ready and it's nearly ready and we should be okay. Our stock held up pretty well for um, uh, for about a year. But the chinks started showing in the armor around the time of the Olympics. So, but, you know, by the end of 2000 and uh, early 2001, um, you know, things were, uh, were pretty volatile. I started here on December 21, 2001, which is probably uh, the lowest point, or arguably the lowest point in Ostar's financial history. At one point, you know, we were, I think, the 40th largest company on the Australian Stock Exchange. <laughs> we quite quickly went down to being a, 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 a penny stock during that period. I spent 99% of my time convincing banks that Ostar's a, a good going concern. There was Phil and I sitting there and um, our banking lawyer's just looking at us and he's like, you're insolvent. You're trading insolvent. <laughs> 
which was okay, pretty disturbing. Um, and I went next door into John's office and said, so John, our advisors are saying that we're trading insolvently. And John said, so, get another advisor. We were all plugging holes and rowing. <laughs> and you know, wondering whether we should just pull the plugs out and chuck the oars away. <laughs> we chose to disagree with it and 10 years on, here we are, having survived to tell the tale. Yeah, it was a big, very emotional period for me and uh, for many others, of course. As we say where I grew up, the buck stops here. It was very clear that if anyone was going to work through these problems, it was this team. I've never seen anything like it in business or otherwise, or experienced anything like it. Um, and it was a privilege to be able to, to be part of that team because everybody pulled their weight. There was a famous boat quote from John, if you're drilling holes in the boat, get out. You know, if, you, if you're those type of people, we don't want you. We were still able to attract great talent because they also could see, you know, when peeking underneath the covers, that there was still plenty of life left in this company. We actually had AFL and NRL before anybody else did. We were really innovative. We were doing things with TV that no one else in Australia was doing. Some things that Fox was really only started doing the last couple of years, like interactive advertising. It's not well known that, that we were, you know, sort of pioneers in that whole area as well. When Foxtel and Optus went off and announced the content sharing deal, which was a bit weird because we were actually meant to be in merger negotiations with Optus at the time, but the fact was they couldn't do that deal without our permission because we had contracts with Optus on the satellite side and then we had contracts with Foxtel on the content side. Once they announced that, I saw that as a massive opportunity for us and, um, and that really started to get me a lot more positive about where things would go. I think that was the light bulb moment for me. I thought there is definite opportunity here. I do understand the, you know, all the, the potential challenges. If we can actually build a great team, get the marketing department at that time heading in, the, in one direction, get them really excited about the product. The company was never in as bad a shape as the media made it out to be. You know, the company was still adding subscribers, it was still growing. Champ was in the right place at the right time. They were finishing their due diligence and they rang up one day and they said, we've just been working through this from a risk management point of view. So the entire business is dependent on the satellite. What happens if there's a meteor shower? And I said, well, quite frankly, one meteor shower could really ruin your entire day. The person that deserves the most credit in that regard is Bill Ferris. And we very quickly built up an enormous amount of trust. And I think that's what enabled us to join arms with them in the turnaround and then for them to, to profit. New Ostar Digital was a complete step change for the organisation. And all of a sudden we had 20 new channels, this new pricing, this new packaging, all the functionality as well. Hey guys, it's here! When it happened, it flattened us. I've never seen such a, a successful product launch. Call 132 342 today. We turned it on within two minutes. The, the queue was over an hour long on the phones. And you sort of sat back and you thought, gosh, you know, we've really nailed this. We've given them what they wanted. Happier customers, 20 new channels. How cool is that? Awesome. Customers are happy, staff are delighted, they're excited about our product, and it really sort of took us from this sort of just a very simple pay TV model into a brave new world. We budgeted to do about 50,000 switches from the old product to the new product in the first month. We did 70,000 on the first week. It just went berserk. To see the product change, um, even during the period that I have been involved, has been huge. I mean, to be able to introduce the MyStar and all of the convenience that goes with that. Like being able to pause live TV. To move from standard definition into high definition, that's amazing, and Ozstar made that happen. When you're a subscription business, you know, you need to continually be adding value to your existing customers and giving non-customers a reason to, to subscribe. Working with the channels, making sure that the channels were bringing the best product that they could into regional homes was a great opportunity for me. We've been able to be part of making some great Australian drama and making sure that the products that's produced and that the channels are relevant to people in regional Australia. That is definitely television worth paying for. Obviously when you are sitting in Sydney, the only way you can be relevant is actually getting out there and bringing your brand to life in your regional markets. We do things with our channels like the Channel V Music Bus. and some of the regional towns would pull the bus in, the bus would open up and an amazing band would pop out. Hello, 
We've done Nickelodeon Takes Over Your Park, where we go out into regional towns and just take over with Dora and Diego and whatever else the channel was promoting at the time. You just got to take SpongeBob on the road and everybody goes wild, crazy. Kids flock for miles and they're so grateful as well. Coming from regional Australia, I was really passionate about giving something to them before the city people had it. What we did across regional Australia, no one had done before. Not the Telstras of the world or the free to airs of the world. And we used local installation people. That was an important link. Everyone used to say, you know, what's the best thing about working at Austar? And they always said it's the people. And whilst that was very true, we wanted to try and understand that a little bit more. So we spent some time trying to define our culture and the Ostar way grew out of that attempt to define it. I've never experienced this sort of camaraderie, I guess. And it's been tough, you know, it hasn't all just been, you know, cheese and pickies on along the way. <laughs> but culturally, we've been very strong. The Ostar way, it doesn't have to be written down. It just kind of is the way we do things. It is a privilege um, to have, you know, been part of building this company from a piece of paper to a two and a half billion dollar enterprise over 17 years. I guess we know it's coming to an end, but it's been such a good time and we've had such a good run. You don't get that everywhere. I've learned so much and I have met some amazing, amazing people. I'm really excited about what the next 10 years um, are going to to bring. I love this business, you know, and I've, I've been very, very fortunate to be part of what I've been part of. But, you know, the thing that I'm not frightened of is the future. I used to be frightened of change. I used to, used to scare the living daylights out of me. And over the course of the years, there's been lots and lots of change. We've had to adapt and move. I'm not frightened of changes at all. I'm, I'll embrace them. I see Ostar as a bit of a family. It's, I leave one family in the morning and come to another. Um, and I'll certainly miss that. I, I don't expect I'll get it anywhere else ever again. In between the, the dramas um, and the challenges, we all went out and had a lot of fun. I think it'll be a very sad day, a very, very sad day for a lot of people, not only internally, but for a lot of our partners um, and our customers, the day that Ostar no longer is Ostar. Ostar has been obviously the single greatest professional experience of my life because it is me, it, you know, it, is, it reflects everything about me and everything that I've done. 